chapter number 19. You know, many of us have heard of uh, Benjamin Franklin. Of course, he was one of our more prominent founding fathers. Though he didn't, he never claimed to be a, a born-again Christian, from what I understand. He did make some very interesting remarks during the Continental Convention on June 28, 1787. He says, I have lived for a long time. At that time, he was 81 years of age. And the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see of this truth, that God governs in the affairs of men. Whether or not Mr. Franklin really understood what he was saying or not, what he said is a very powerful biblical truth. As we face each day in a world that really seems like it could fall apart at any moment, doesn't it? Yet the Bible tells us that God rules and controls all things in an effort to win the hearts of people back to him. Here in Revelation chapter 19, we'll pick it up in verse 1. It says, And after these things I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. Again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke arose up forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Alleluia. And a voice came out of the throne, saying, Praise our God, all ye his, his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of, of mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let's skip down to verse number 11. It says, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in white, or in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth flowed a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of of lords. This passage here is what I would say is the culmination of human history with the bodily return of Jesus Christ back here on planet Earth. And at this point in, in the story, so to say, he comes back and he conquers the enemies, his enemies, I should say, under the leadership of the Antichrist, and establishes his rule here on Earth. It's known as the Millennial Kingdom. In fact, if you look at Revelation 20, verse 4, it says, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads, or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. That's the millennial kingdom, this reigning of Christ upon this earth. But all the events of human history are being used to bring this major event to fruition. And God's orchestrating every bit of it. And that's an important thing to understand as we talk about this truth for today. And it's the truth that God reigns. We'll look at this a little bit more. Let's pray first. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your great sovereignty over this world. And Lord, sometimes we look at it and we think, how can anything good come out of it? But Lord, because of you, good things will eventually come out of it. And Father, I just pray that you would help us to embrace this truth here today that you may be magnified and honored. We ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, to help you understand the perspective of which I speak from today, it's helpful to understand just some basic Bible prophecy. See, the next event on God's prophetic calendar is known as the rapture. First Thessalonians 4, verses 16 through 17 refer to it. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. The word rapture comes from the phrase they're caught up. And of course, it's the Latin word rapto. We get the word rapture from it. Don't, don't get shook up because the word rapture isn't in the Bible. The precept is. And it's this, it's this point in time where that can happen really at any moment. It's eminent, the Bible teaches, in which the, well, Jesus Christ will have this trumpet sound, and those that are saved are going to be caught up from this earth and be taken on to heaven. 
So that sounds like a fairy tale. I know it sounds a little far out, but it's still biblical. It's still there. And uh, it, it's still biblical truth. And at that point in time, the world is going to plunge into a period unlike any other period that's ever existed. It's, it's seven years in length. It's known as the tribulation period. Matthew 24, verse 21 refers to it. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. It's a time period that will be upon this earth where there will be great lawlessness. There will be lots of anguish, and much of the world's population will die at that point in time. And God allows at this point the sin nature of mankind to go unrestrained. Believe it or not, in this world where there's a lot of heartache, a lot of atrocities going on, the Holy Spirit of God is still restraining sin. <laughs> it's hard to believe when you think about some of the things that go on in this world, but the Holy Spirit of God is still restraining man's sin to a certain point. But when the rapture takes place, the Holy Spirit of God is lifted off the earth. That's why the saints have to go with them, because the Holy Spirit of God dwells within us. And man is left to his own device. And he's going to follow his sinful flesh wherever it leads, because there's nothing going to be restraining it. Matthew 24, verse 22, it says, except those days should be short, and there should no flesh be saved. In other words, nobody would live through it if God didn't shorten it at seven years. And if you've, we've studied the book of Revelation around here before, and we've looked at it, where millions of people actually end up losing their life through this time period. It's a very, very uh, dark period in, in human history. And it's during that time frame that a man will arise who will assume total power and authority over the earth. He's known as the Antichrist, the Beast, uh, the little horn, the wicked one, the son of perdition. He's, he's named a number of things in the Bible. Primarily, the word beast is used in Revelation. It mentions in Revelation 13, verses 7 and 8, and was given unto him, this Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given, un, given him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. In other words, that's referring to the whole world. And all that dwelt upon the earth shall but worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. The whole world is going to worship this man. There's going to be a man, no, unlike, or no man will ever have been like him. He's going to get a hold of people, and he's going, to be, he's going to mesmerize people by some of the things that he does. In fact, if you study out Revelation 13, he's going to even pull off a resurrection. He's going to be killed, and then he's going to be resurrected. And it's quite, it's quite an interesting situation. But as you see, the world will highly revere him. He'll be the ultimate humanist, claiming to have answers to the world's greatest problems and seeming to be able to solve them. In fact, one of the, one of the problems he will solve, at least temporarily, is the, is, the, is the problems going on in the Middle East. He will broker a peace agreement between the Jews and the Palestinians. Now, president after president after president here in the United States has attempted to do that and has failed. This man is going to be able to do it. And it's going to be quite interesting how he does it. But yet, it, it, when he's here, it will be a reign of terror like no di other dictator the world has ever known. In fact, go back to Daniel chapter number 8. Daniel is kind of the counterpart to, in the Old Testament, of the, new, of, uh, the book of Revelation in the New Testament. In Daniel chapter 8, it, it talks about a little bit about this man known as the Antichrist. Verse 23, it says, In the latter time of their kingdom, when the transgressors are come to the fall, a king of fierce countenance, this is the Antichrist, and understanding dark sentences shall stand up. In other words, he'll elevate in this world. And his power shall be mighty, but not by his own power, and he shall destroy wonderfully, and shall prosper and practice, and shall destroy the mighty and the holy people. In other words, he's going to persecute God's people. Christians. In fact, he's going, to, he's going to kill all of them that do get saved during the tribulation period. Verse 25, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He'll be a peace seeker, but through those peace processes, he's going to gain power. And through that power, he'll eventually elevate to uh, king of the world in so many words. And by peace shall destroy many, he shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Of course, the prince of princes speaking of Jesus Christ. Because at the end of the seven-year period, 
this Antichrist will mass the world's armies together into a place called Armageddon. Now, many of us have heard the term Armageddon before. It comes from Revelation chapter 16, verse 16. If you're back there, you can quick look at it. It says here, in Revelation 16, 16, and he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. That takes place, that location is over in Israel, is in a place known as the Valley of Jezreel, and overlooking the, and the, the ancient city of Megiddo uh, overlooks this valley, or at least this portion of the valley. I've been to Israel, I've been to, the, I've been to this location a couple times, and, and you see this vast valley, and I, I remember standing upon the, the, the mountain there where Megiddo sits, and overlooking this valley, and, and thinking to myself what it would be like with this whole valley filled with, with the armies of the world, the people that are marching down to it, and what they're doing at that time is that, that the Antichrist, which I believe at that point in time has basically become Satan incarnate, Satan possesses this man, masses a final assault against the Jewish people. And the reason he's going after the Jewish people is because the Jewish people uh, hold the key to prophecy. You take out the Jewish people out of prophecy, God can't fulfill them. The Jewish people are a key point in prophecy. And for all prophecies to be fulfilled, the Jews have to be in their land, and they have to exist. Well, the devil, through the Antichrist, is trying to destroy the Jews. And uh, he makes one final attempt here, if you will, but he stops short in this valley, the valley we know to be Armageddon. And that's what Revelation chapter 19 is all about, where Jesus Christ makes his triumphant return. He comes from heaven with the, with the, with the angel, or with the saints, that are up there, and he fights this battle. And the saints don't have to really weld the sword. They just get following so many words watch. But before Jesus leaves heaven to fight this battle, so to say, evidently there's kind of a pet best, <laughs> that's the best way I can put it, takes place with the saints in heaven. That's what we see in verses 1 through 6. They're celebrating. They're rejoicing. And at the end of verse 6, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. What's going on here is that they're rejoicing because God has proven at this point that he is in complete control of everything that's about to take place. And he's finally going to put an end to the insanity that goes on in this world. Of course, the tribulation uh, period being at when the world's at its worst. You know, we live in a world, don't we, that just seems to, at times, be just out of control. It's, um, it, it's amazing sometimes, like, this world just doesn't fall apart. Well, well, some crazy person doesn't push a button and sends a nuclear bomb somewhere and blows up or, or something and, and, and there's a retaliation and so forth. I, th I think both Russia and the United States have enough nuclear bombs to blow the world up several times over from what I understand. And it, it, it's incredible that that just doesn't happen. You know, we live in a country today where the Attorney General, I think it was this past week, uh, said that it doesn't matter to these state Attorney Generals, if you don't agree with the law, you don't have to enforce it. That's what you call lawlessness. <laughs> and we've got the Attorney General of the United States saying that kind of stuff. You know, we've got today upheavals in, in societies. So we could talk about the country of Ukraine that's been big in the news here in the last couple days. You got security threats all the time, terrorism, nation rising against nation, problem here, problem there, and, and uh, they formed the United Nations to try to end the wars, you know, World One, World War Two, that we won't have any more of those wars, but we still have them, don't we? There's constant problems. Yet the Bible teaches us that despite all we see on the nightly news, God still reigns. God still reigns in all this. Hebrews one three. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, speaking of Christ, and upholding all things by the word of his power. Despite all the craziness, the reason it doesn't fall apart is God's upholding it. God's upholding it. He's controlling it. He's working to bring about a wonderful conclusion to a world that desperately needs it. And whether they realize it or not. And as a Christian, you can kind of you can rejoice in this truth because I tell you something, it can give you some peace in a world that's desperately searching for it. You know, people are scared in this world, let me tell you something. But God's people don't have to be because God told us what's going to happen and shows through telling us what's going to happen that He is in control and He reigns. That's something we, we need to grasp, especially as the days get closer and closer to the second coming of Christ. 
you know, things are going to go up in arms even more. But thankfully, we, we can rejoice in the fact that God still reigns. We'll look at this a little bit closer as we see that God reigns in this faltering world. This faltering world. As I mentioned, we have a world that seems like at any moment can fall apart. Doesn't it? You know, some of you were around at this time when the Cuban Missile Crisis took place back in, I think it was 1962, where the you know, Russians were, were building nuclear heads, or putting nuclear heads in Cuba, and, and kind of in retaliation to us putting nuclear heads in Turkey and Italy, if I remember correctly, or something like that. And there was a time, I think a week time or something like that, or a few months, where it was like the world was on the brink of a nuclear disaster. And I, I wasn't alive at that time, but I've read accounts of that and the concerns that were going on at that time. It was a very high pressure situation. Yet it was abated. And we could talk about other conflicts, you know, of course, that I, what's fresh in my mind is that Ukrainian thing. I've actually been kind of interested in that. So it, it's been on my mind a lot. Of all these things that are going on, and, and there's many other issues going around that you don't even hear about sometimes. Of course, the Middle East is a big place. There's, there's places where terrorism goes on on, on a frequent basis. There's, a, there's been economic upheaval, and of course, things are still shaky. Some people say, oh, we're back, you know, everything's going, well, things are still a little bit shaky. They really are. Maybe the Dow's at, what, 15, 16,000, something like that, but things are still shaky. People still have a hard time getting jobs. You know, everything's, we're still, what, $17 trillion in debt. <laughs> We've still got some problems. That's just this country. How many countries over in Europe right now are practically bankrupt? There's, a, there's an economic upheaval. Of course, there's political chaos. Again, it seems like there's times when we, it appears that we could be on the brink of a worldwide catastrophe. Did God said all this stuff that we see going on, what happened? Matthew 24, verses 6 through 8. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all those, all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes and diverse places. All these are the kingdom of sorrows. I mean, you could probably think of Nations going against nations, kingdoms against kingdoms. You think of places where there's famine going on and pestilences. And there's been you know, some major earthquakes over the last few years. All this was the beginning, is just the beginning. But it's something that would be prevalent in the day in which we live. Second Timothy 3 1 mentions this know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. It's part of it's part of the package. It's part of what, what's going to happen in, in, the, in the days leading up to the time Christ returns. And despite that, God still sits on his throne, ruling and reigning the nations of the world. You know, there's several verses we can look at. I'm going to give you four out of the book of Psalms and just show and, and teach God reigns in this world. Psalm 83, 18. That men may know that thou whose name all, alone is Jehovah art the most high over all the earth. Psalm 99, verse 1, The Lord reigneth, let the people tremble. He sitteth between the cherubims, let the earth be moved. Psalm 103, verse 19, The Lord hath prepared his throne in the heavens, and his kingdom ruleth over all. Psalm 146, 10, The Lord shall reign forever, even the thy God, O Zion, unto all generations, praise ye the Lord. There are so many verses in the Bible that teach that God reigns. It talks about him being the governor of uh, the, the nations. Of course, it talks about him in our text here being the king of kings and lord of lords. God rules in the affairs of man. And history, if you have a Christian perspective, a biblical perspective on world history, you can see that. You can see that in ways that are amazing, actually. And God's directing everything that happens for his divine purpose is to bring a culmination to his divine plan. And nothing gets out of God's control. I don't know, maybe you've overseen something before and it got out of hand for you. <laughs> you know, some, we are limited in what we can control in some regards. But God isn't limited at all. 
And uh, that's, that's amazing to think about. Because there's a lot that God has to manage. But he manages it with, without even breaking a sweat. <laughs> but he does it. You know, all the situations that occur in this world are the purpose of, that are designed to bring God glory and ultimately to bring people to the knowledge of Him. Every circumstance, every situation, everything that crops up in this world is designed ultimately to bring God glory and to bring people to the knowledge of Him. All the actions by all the governments around the globe are designed for that purpose. You know that God is in control of putting people in their positions as authorities in this world? You know, we, we look at elections, and sometimes, you know, you, you don't like who got elected for various reasons. Or you look at some other countries, like, how did that guy get in power? Or that gal, or whatever the case might be. Who's in control of all that? God. Back to the book of Daniel. Daniel's a good book if you want to talk about politics. God, Daniel's a politician. But God reveals a lot of things about how he handles and uses world leaders in the book of Daniel. Daniel 4, verse 17. Here Daniel is talking to the king of, of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. It says, This matter is by the decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he willeth and setteth up over it. Notice the basis of men. In other words, God's not afraid to put a stinker in as a leader if it pushes people to seek Him. It's kind of a powerful truth. It's a very powerful truth. You know, decisions made by government leaders are often used for a purpose of bringing God glory, whether they're good or even bad. You know, the Bible says in Proverbs 21, 1, the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord, as the rivers of water, and he turneth it whithersoever he will. God's allowing and not allowing decisions to take place in these positions. And God uses those government authorities for a purpose, to bring him glory, and, to, and for people to to seek Him and to come to the knowledge of Him. Now, some of you might be sitting out there and say, I just don't see how that can be with some of the things that happen with some of these leaders. I know. You're telling me. I don't understand why North Korea today is under the dictatorship of the, the Kim family. I don't understand that. I've talked to Koreans over there. and They've tried to give me an explanation why they think it is. But I don't know that today. I don't know why Putin is over Russia today. But it seemed like they were making reforms and all that kind of stuff. And it seems like they're starting to go backwards now. In fact, the Bible talks a lot about Russia and some of her and some of that area of the world one day coming against Israel. And God's putting putting all these pieces into play. Now some people question, why did George W. Bush invade Iraq? Well, God had a part in that. That doesn't make any sense. I know this much, God rules in the affairs of men. There was a reason behind it. In fact, it's kind of interesting, some of the things, if you knew anything about what Saddam, Saddam Hussein was doing, Saddam Hussein was actually trying to amass an army together to go to Jerusalem and take it over. Until they sent a Texan into the White House this time. God rules in the affairs of men. Like it or not, but that's, God knows what he's doing. We don't always agree with God. We sometimes, God, well, you're, you must have fallen off your throne. But God's reasoning is much higher than our reasoning. And you and I will never be able to figure it out this side of the world. Isaiah 55, verses 8 and 9 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Don't even begin to try to figure out, God, you're not going to do it. And why he allows certain things, I don't know. But it's for the purpose of glorifying himself and seeing people come to the knowledge of him. Sometimes God allows certain leaders in a country to bring a little persecution to, in some cases, wake up the Christians. 
something we need to keep in mind in our country. I think our country has fallen asleep a little bit too much at the wheel in Christianity. Uh, there, we've, we've got some issues in, in Christianity, if I, if I can use that term. But a lot of Christianity has become very worldly, uninterested in serving the Creator, more interested in pleasing the flesh. And you know what? You know what purifies persecution because it gets people serious with God, and that, that's what you see back in the Old Testament with the Israel. God had to had to put. Get, get the, a thumb on them for a while before they got right. When they got right, God turned things around and blessed and things like that in Israel's history. It's just the nature of man, unfortunately. But you have to remember, God's always working about a greater good. Romans 8.28, where we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. And one day this mess in this world will end. <laughs> And peace will truly reign. But God is working to bring as many people to himself through these events of history. Every, every tragedy is meant to push people towards him. And again, I can't explain everything. But I do know that God is doing this stuff for a greater good. Why? Because he loves people. Second Peter 3.9 The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Men, some men count slackness, but his long suffering to us were not willing that any should perish. It's not his desire that anybody dies and goes on to a Christless eternity, but that all should come to repentance. In other words, it's saved. And God has used political leaders, has used even leaders on a, on a lower governmental level to accomplish his purposes. And it's always designed to bring people to him in the end. And having a biblical worldview certainly changes our perspective of this world. You know, if you don't have a biblical worldview, then you're going to have some problems understanding why these things happen. But from a biblical perspective, it all makes sense from God's perspective. Secondly, God reigns in the finite world. And what I'm speaking about is our lives, primarily. We are finite. We, we are limited in space and time and so forth. And uh, God still reigns even in, in our world. You know, I've, I've flown over many major cities and uh, I always, I like, I like my window seat. I like looking out. And uh, I, I've seen, uh, as I've flown over cities like uh, Los Angeles, Minneapolis here, and, and uh, Bangkok, Thailand, Tokyo, Seoul, uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's got over 20 million people in it. And I look down, and, and you know, you see house after house after house. I mean, just as far as, in some cases, the eye can see it, though. And I, th I, I think about those, and I, and I think about how each house represents a family. And within that family, there's, you know, X amount of lives, one to, you know, however many. A life that's got problems, a life that has some good things happening. One person over here is getting married. This person just lost their father. This person over here just lost a son. This person over here just lost their job. This person just got a job. You know, all the complexities of just one life. And as you fly over, you see there's zillions of them. Well, billions, I guess, but there's many of them. There's, there's several. In fact, according to uh, statisticians, there's over 7.1 billion people that live in this world. And God is working in every one of their cases. Some to bring to salvation. Most, I believe, to bring to salvation. Others to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the saved. And God is working in those lives. And he knows every intricate detail of those lives. Luke 12, verse 7. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, ye are more value than many sparrows. The God who created this huge universe is very interested in the intricate details of our very lives. Every person represented here. And every person who's out there. And he's in control of the things that happen in each person's life. So that obviously brings up the question, then why does he allow bad things to happen? Why does he allow the heartaches in my life? Why has he allowed that? You know, that's a big question. That's a, that's a big question. Of course, people use that question or, or the supposed answer to that question to 
blame God and to get mad at God and get bitter at God and uh, reasons why they reject God and so forth. And you know, we could sit here today and, and if you opened up your heart, I bet you everyone here would have a have a story to tell of something bad happening to them and not understanding why it happened and so forth. Every person goes through bad circumstances. And some people say, well, I've had it worse. Maybe you have. But there is still a, a reason behind it. Part of it is because when bad things happen, again, people tend to seek God. You know, when things are going good in life, I've noticed people have no time for God. People have absolutely no time for God. They forsake Him. Even Christians do that. Even Christians, those who claim Jesus Christ as personal Savior, when everything is just going hunky-dory, if you will, in life, we tend to forget God. That's, that's the sinful nature about us. <laughs> prone to wander, Lord, I feel, and prone to believe the God I love. The old song goes. When bad things happen, though, people are more apt to run to God. Now, part of the reason is the fact that within this, also is that within the spirit of God's control, God allows mankind space to exercise his free will, too. Now, I can't explain that 100%. Now, there's people that have tried. It's called Reformed Theology, or Calvinism, if you will. It basically says that, in so many words, that God has created people to go to heaven, go to hell, and so forth. And, and it, it, it puts an extra emphasis on God's sovereignty. Well, however, in the, in the meantime, he ignores some of the other things that it says about the fact that, uh, you know, whosoever will may come, and uh, whosoever, uh, God does not desire that any should perish. When Jesus came to this earth in Luke chapter 2, it says that uh, this was a message for all people. Well, you know, the message of salvation, if it's just for the certain select people, that's not good news to those that didn't get it, right? So, I mean, there's some problems there. You, you have to overlook some things to completely embrace that. And everyone, you know, every Reformed theologian out there, or those that follow that, have their own take on Reformed theology and would probably debate some things, but but it's it's an effort to try to explain God's sovereignty over man's will. But somehow God makes it work, though, and I, I can't a hundred percent understand that. But it's this free will that does choose to sin against the Creator, which affects the things that happen in this world. James one fifteen says, "Then when lust hath conceived, to bring forth sin, and sin when it is finished." bringeth forth death. So God within the spirit of his control, as man exercises free will, which tends to be sinful, which causes massive problems. But what's amazing, though, is that God can still bring all those negative choices mankind makes. He can take those and still find a way to bring out good. To me, that shows a lot of power. <laughs> that, that, that shows an incredible power amounts of authority to still be able to do that. We couldn't do that, but God can. God can. Romans 8.28, again, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. And by the way, if, if something does happen in a person's life, it's meant to eventually bring good. And you know what? I believe God will stop certain things that will not ultimately bring good. I, I believe that. I believe he is at work. I believe he will interject in some cases. You know, in, it was uh, the year 1588. At that time, Spain was the world dominating power. And if you know your history, in 1588, I mean, secular people have told me this, it was a turning point in Western history. Spain was going to invade England. They, spent, they sent what was called the Spanish Armada. They were going to overtake England, but there was a massive storm that hit in the middle of this fleet going to England to conquer it. Wiped out a mass amount of the Armada in which enough were only the, the British had to pick off a few of them. And that was kind of the, the beginning of the decline of the Kingdom of Spain, but it was the, the beginning of the rise of the Kingdom of England, or the, the British Empire, if you will. What's interesting to note is that the British Empire eventually goes on and, you know, they colonize all over the world, don't they? In fact, it was said that the British Empire, uh, the sun never set upon the British Empire for a time of year. 
And there's, there's colonies all over, there, there, there are influences everywhere, especially that driving on the wrong side of the road stuff. I mean, in countries like that, it's like, you know, that's hard to do. But you know what? How many countries in this world today, because of that, speak English? Or English is a strong second language. In fact, English is the trade language of the day, the business language of today. When I guess when a Putin applied Sochi to be the Winter Olympic spot, he had to give a presentation in English. The gal who represented South Korea will host the 2018 Winter Games. She's a phenom in, in, the, in the figure skating world. Doesn't know English very well, but had to give her presentation in English. <laughs> Why? Because English is the trade language of the world. Well, isn't that convenient for us to get the gospel into these countries? where English is available. It makes it a lot easier, doesn't it? God united the world through a language. He did it in the past with the Greek Empire, when Alexander the Great swept across much of the known world and, and Hellenized it, or, or made it Greek the official language. It made it very easy in Paul's day to be able to go to location after location in, the, in that world, and he could speak Greek very easily. Who's behind all that? God. The day Jesus Christ, or just before Jesus Christ was to be born, he was in Nazareth with his mother, and, and she, they weren't moving anywhere. You don't move a pregnant lady, <laughs> especially back in those days without a car. But God impressed upon Caesar Augustus at that time to demand a tax. And everyone was like, God, ah, what's going on here? We're getting taxed again? No, God was moving his child to be born the Son of God be born in Bethlehem. They had to go back there. The only way they were going to move is by them being forced to move. There was, very, there was a lot of implications to that. Who was behind Caesar Augustus? God. God. Again, it just these examples prove over and over and over God's control over this world and this universe. As we begin to contemplate the vastness of the universe itself, even, and God's control over it, it can sure bring a lot of peace to our hearts and situations probably in our lives. The fact that God operates this whole thing, spoken into existence without even breaking a sweat, I tell you something, it makes our problems shrink significantly. Oh, wow, I can rest my life in the hands of the Creator. Well, I could, I could use example of example of this happening. And God allowed things to happen. And will allow things to happen to always bring good, even again when it doesn't make sense to us. You know, there's a country, I suppose 10, 15 years ago now, that broke off from the country of Indonesia. And uh, it's called East Timor. And uh, I know a missionary, actually we support him top of the day, that was involved over there trying to get the gospel involved during this very critical transition period. People were very hungry and very open for the gospel. Well, evidently, somebody, somebody got the burden to go there, raised the support, went around deputation, went raised the support. He was about, I think he was in his upper 20s, low 30s, something like that. All ready to go, wife and four kids. Comes to find out before they leave, he's got terminal cancer and he dies. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't. It doesn't at all. But evidently to God it does. Well, there was a Bible college that had some students, I believe they were in Florida traveling, and uh, they were uh, presenting the Bible college to different churches and just trying to serve the Lord. When in the car they, uh, they were passing another vehicle on the highway, and this vehicle, uh, evidently the tire blew or something, and swerved into their lane and hit them direct on, and all four were killed. They were young people. They, they were in their lower 20s. They got, why did that happen? I don't know. I, I remember hearing about that. And evidently, the authorities found uh, whether CD cases that had been burned up, and, and everything had been burned except a little piece that said something on the lines that God makes no mistakes. God makes no mistakes. Now, we would say that was a mistake, though, but Again, it's not always easy to grasp 
but it certainly gives us some incredible hope in this world that we live in. Charles Haddon Spurgeon once said, there is no attribute more comforting to his children than that of God's sovereignty. Under the most adverse circumstances and the most severe trials, they believe that sovereignty has ordained their afflictions, that sovereignty overrules them, that sovereignty will sanctify them all. There is nothing uh, for which the children ought to more earnestly contend than the doctrine of their master over all creation. The kingship of God over all the works of his own hands, the throne of God and his right to sit upon that throne, for it is God upon the throne whom we trust. And God certainly reigns in all of life's circumstances. Well, thirdly, and finally, and we've got to move very quickly here, the future world. Now, as we approach the second coming of Jesus Christ, the world is, I guess, going just to continue to get worse. Now, I'm not trying to be a pessimist here, but... That's what the Bible tells us. 2 Timothy 3, verses 13, it says, But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Jesus said himself, Matthew 24, 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. What were the days of Noah like? Well, Genesis 6, 5 says, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <laughs> so, needless to say, Things aren't necessarily going to get better. And the tribulation period will be the ultimate viewing of it, but God is still in control. And he's placing things in position for a great future. It'll come to a point, as we discussed earlier, where things will look bleak, <laughs> look very bleak on earth. But God will turn all things around. We can go to Revelation 21. We don't have time to go there today. But it talks about how God will wipe away all tears one day. And everything will, will go well again, and, and the sin curse will be taken away, and so forth. One day all the chaos will end. One day peace will really reign. And if you're a born-again Christian here today, you've got a bright future ahead of you. You've got a great future ahead of you. And God's in control of it all. He's working His plan to bring this to pass. He hasn't lost control one bit. Now, if you're not saved here today, you don't have a bright future. I, I hate to admit that to you. But it's the truth from the Word of God. Your future is in Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heavens fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. That's somebody who's never been saved, the dead. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. That's, not, that's the future of a lost person. Somebody who's never had a time in their life when they trusted Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. But you know what? That doesn't have to be your future. God has provided a hope for you as he did for me. Years and 15, almost 15 years ago, I trusted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I was on this road. I would have been, on, when this day happened, I would have been at, the, at that great white throne. But the day Jesus Christ saved my soul, He took me off that road that was going to lead me to that great white throne. He put me on a new road that was going to lead me into eternal bliss. And you can have that here today, too. But you have to recognize, first off, your sinful condition before God, that you are a sinner. And that you deserve the just punishment for sin. Yet, if you're willing to turn from that sin with all your heart and place 100% faith in Jesus Christ alone to pay for your sins, you can be saved too. You can escape this judgment and receive the eternal bliss that God has provided. And you can have hope. You can have that hope. You know, and God may be allowing some things in your life to get you to come to that point as well. See, in God's economy, the only thing that matters are the matters of eternity. You follow me? All that matters to God is what happens in eternity, is people getting into the, into the eternal. You know, we can, have, we can suffer through this life, and if we gain heaven, we, we, we're going to be okay. We can live comfortably in this life and miss heaven and die lost. You know what? That's for eternity. God places well, way more emphasis on the eternal than he does the temporal of this life. And that's why he wants people to get saved. And that's why he has things happen, trying to push people to come back to him. Maybe today you need to get saved. 
we encourage you to do that today before it's eternally too late. And then you can enjoy the benefits of a God who reigns. And let those that claim Christ as Savior rejoice in that truth because it is a very powerful one and can help you understand this world and where it's going. Yeah, it might get bad for a little while, but in the end, it's going to be great. God help us to embrace the time. Let's